So welcome everyone to the UMass Department of Architecture Fall 2021 lecture series. So this is the last lecture of our fall series. So I'd, I'd actually like to start by thanking those who have put together what has really been an, an awesome lecture series. So first and foremost, Assistant Professor Rob Williams has been the coordinator of the lecture series this year. And he's been um, helped by uh, Julie Sarzinski and Jean Crossman from our front office, and then from by Perry Riahi, who used to be our lecture series coordinator. And then our, also our work study students, Hector and Ivan, have been very helpful in this year's series. So thank you to all of you. So tonight is the David Dillon Memorial Lecture. So first, a few words about David. So David was, is probably best known as the architecture critic for the Dallas Morning News, a position that he held for 25 years ending in 2006 when he retired from the newspaper. But most of that period that he was the architecture critic for the morning news, he lived right here in Amherst, Massachusetts. So in 2006, as he was retiring from the newspaper, he became very involved in what's now the Department of Architecture. So he began teaching courses like junior year writing, architecture history, he became a thesis advisor and he became a frequent juror on our, an advisor to our design studios, both at UMass Amherst, but then also at Amherst College. He died suddenly and unexpectedly in 2006. His um, family and his many friends and colleagues brainstormed some ideas to continue his legacy here at UMass. And the, the, day, the endowed David Dillon Memorial Lecture is a result of that. So I believe that tonight is the 11th annual David Dillon Memorial Lecture, but I really wanna thank so many of you that are here tonight that contributed in particular, Sally Dillon, who is here in the audience. And, and, and at the end of the lecture, we're going to welcome in everyone in the audience into the main Zoom room and you'll get a chance to um, chat both with Catherine Williams tonight's lecture, but then also with Sally Dillon, her family members and their friends. So it's a great honor to introduce tonight's Dillon Memorial Lecturer, Catherine Williams. So Catherine AIA NOMA is a licensed architect in Northern Virginia and currently senior project manager for construction at a DC university. Her career path includes work in traditional architecture firms, community development, and managing commercial construction for a general contractor. She restarted the Black Women in Architecture Brunch in DC, an annual event, and she co-founded the Desiree Cooper ARE Scholarship and is a founding panelist for Riding the Vortex. She has written about architecture and development and served as an editor for multiple publications. She was a NOMA magazine editor from 2009 to 2014. In 2020, she published Melvin Mitchell's book, African American Architects, Embracing Culture and Building Urban Communities. Catherine served as chair of the AIA Housing and Community Development Knowledge Community Advisory Group. And as a side note, this Catherine and I served together on this, on this uh, knowledge community for many years and she currently serves on the AIA Continuing Education Committee. She's a board member of the Village of Love and Resistance, working to build a cooperative community in East Baltimore. She was an Enterprise Rose Architectural Fellow in San Francisco, and she received the 2016 AIA Virginia Emerging Professionals Award and the 2013 National Organization of Minority Architects, NOMA, President's Award. She writes at CatherineW.com, that's Catherine with a K, W.com, and is publisher and editor for ArchStories.com and BWANetwork.com. So please join me in welcoming Catherine Williams.
Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, this is actually my second time back at UMass because I spoke uh, to Carrie Klaus's class uh, last semester, I guess. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen here. Uh, let's see. All right. Not sure I have the right screen. Oh. All right, let me try this one more time. Sorry about that. While Catherine is doing this, I also want to acknowledge that uh, Sally Dillon is here, but also David's son Chris is here, and that was in the chat. Box, which I didn't see until just now. So welcome, Sally and Chris. I think I'm having issues sharing my screen. Hold on just a second. Are we good? Looks good, Catherine. Okay, nice. thanks. <laughs> um, technology. <laughs> Uh, so um, my presentation this evening um, will center on service and activism. Um, and um, I think Rob and I talked a lot about what I would present on. Um, as, as Steve read from my bio, um, I've done a lot and have a lot of things going on. Um, within my career, but also like things that I do outside of my nine to five. Um, so I'm very happy to present a, a small portion of my work here. Um, here's a little bit of what I'll go through tonight, just sort of as a setting the tone so you guys can see um, where, I'm, where I'm headed. So service and activism. Um, when we initially started talking about this presentation, I think um, we talked about um, more of as an activism focus, um, but as I started putting my slides together and thinking about my work, um, I realized that service and activism really sort of like have two distinct definitions as far as like their action. Um, and I think we sometimes use these two words interchangeably when really, um, if we look at the definitions, we can see that they're two different things. Um, we may use both to get to an end result, um, but we should understand when we're doing one versus when we're doing the other. Um, and I intended this, this talk to talk about this, uh, to center this talk on activism, but I realized that my focus uh, for my work really has been, um, at least in my, my intentional thinking, I think would say is on service and on doing the work and helping people, but that a lot of that work, um, I think from outsiders or, or people who maybe only see it at the surface looks like activism. Um, so first I wanted to talk about my influence and sort of like how I got to where I am. So uh, growing up, I saw service uh, as an inherent part of my life and a, a part of the people around me. Uh, my grandmother was really active in our church and she was serving on committees and serving on missionary groups. And I saw her and many of her generation of folks always doing for others um, and sort of um, uh, service was, was an intimate part of their lives. Uh, my mother also followed in that path and was very active, um, but she was in our church, but also just active doing things for others. Um, you know, whether that was giving someone a ride somewhere or buying items for others, or just inherently like uh, thinking about others um, and what, what their needs were. Um, and I, I show this photo because I love this like four generations photo when my daughter was born, um, uh, um, well, 20 years ago now. So um, that's the four of us. 
Um, and it was easy for me, I think, to follow those examples. Um, when I was growing up, I was a Girl Scout, um, and that's kind of actually how I came to architecture because I met a girl, I met an architect at a Girl Scout career fair when I was in elementary school. Um, but being in Girl Scouts, um, you know, service is inherently part of, of the work um, or, or Girl Scouts, I'd say, um, in general. And so I think that the, the act of service was always um, a part of what I saw and what I uh, thought that people would be doing um, all their lives. So I went to um, Howard University and the motto of the school is truth and service. So the history of service is inherently part of the legacy of Howard University. And when I was there, I sought out service opportunities and, and was asked to take on some. So I was in student government. Um, I was a part of AIAS. Um, I helped publish the department student newsletter and I volunteered at kids reading at a local library. Um, but I also saw professors who were um, serving on city boards and commissions and, com and encouraging community service projects. Um, I also, uh, just because of the history of Howard, had a glimpse of activism um, and that's, that's inherently part of the legacy um, of the university. After college, I went to a traditional path as far as um, my profession. And I started out as an intern at a small firm and that experience allowed me to see an architect who had a growing practice who also valued service. Um, he was involved in advocating for development in his city and he was active with local and state preservation groups. And I was able to do work that was the benefit of great clients, uh, but I also did things like schematic design for projects for community groups. And um, a lot of the work that I was doing was historic preservation and museum and aviation projects um, when I was there. I also spent a few years at a large firm and I continued some of that historic focus, but also did some municipal work. And at both, at both of those firms, I was able to participate in local organizations. Um, I was on the local AIA chapter board and that sort of allowed me to serve there and then do things like this, which is a kids uh, architecture day event that we did uh, for architecture week one day, uh, sorry, one, one year. And I, I say that just to say that uh, both of those firms really encouraged um, the service part um, and really encouraged giving back to the profession. So um, that was uh, a part of my early professional years and something that I carried forward. So uh, after a few years, I sort of veered off the traditional path and I left um, that uh, traditional firm environment to work in affordable housing and did community development work. And I could say that for me, um, the service part of my work that I had done previously was now what I was getting paid to do on a daily basis. So I helped organize community meetings. Um, I helped create reports of pipeline developments that would impact the neighborhood where I lived and worked. And all of these provided tools for the community. Um, I felt like I was doing the service part and they were sort of doing the activism part. So the, the skills that I brought as an architect, um, as someone who could follow development plans and, and like I said, put these documents together of what all of the impacts, developments that were happening around the community allowed the activists in the community to use those tools when they had to go to neighborhood meetings, um, when they had to um, go talk to city officials, um, or just when, when they had to advocate for their neighborhood, they had those tools um, that, that I had helped create um, to be able to do that. I also worked with community residents to dream up community interventions like community murals, uh, which you see um, in the, on the left-hand side there. Um, and one of the things that I did as part of my work was trying to figure out funding and how to implement this, right? So the community members could come up with the idea and say like, hey, we need this community art project because we have this eyesore in our community of these electrical boxes for this new transit line that's going down our street. How can we um, figure out how to make this an asset for our community and not an eyesore? So again, like the work that I was doing was in service to these community advocates who saw this problem in their neighborhood and um, wanted a way to fix it. The other thing is that I was working for an organization that helped lead the development of a catalyst housing project. So that project helped create new homeowners and a new restaurant space. And the photo at the top right is uh, the restaurant uh, when it, uh, during its grand opening. And some of the work that I did did actually require activism on my part. So as, as a member of this organization, um, this nonprofit, housing and community development organization, 
uh, some of my role was actually doing some of the advocates advocacy at um, city council meetings or at uh, city commission meetings. Um, so one of the things that we did was uh, there was a vacant lot, which you see sort of um, down in this lower photo, um, this lot here. Um, so that lot was vacant and the, the building that we did, that we built this housing project here was across the street on the corner. And uh, after we were uh, finished construction and sort of looking at the neighborhood to see like, okay, what else in this neighborhood can we start to work on that vacant lot? was one of the pieces that our organization felt really important about. So we advocated for and, and ended up purchasing the law. And then we built a community garden, which is what you see up at the top left. And we saw that as an activation in the community of this spot that had been an eyesore. Um, it had been trash thrown and I had a fence in front of it initially. So we wanted to create, again, uh, taking something that was a detriment to the community and making it an advocate making, sorry, making an asset and also activating this to create new positive activity and vibrancy in the neighborhood. So then it became a, a garden that people in the neighborhood could actually use. Restaurants in the neighborhood could actually, um, we had chefs, uh, to the, the restaurant that we did in our building, but also another restaurant next door actually um, participated in helping to grow food there that they could then use in their restaurants. So again, th the service that I sort of did on in my nine to five sort of helped uh, ignite some of the activism of the community members um, in this neighborhood. So the other thing um, that I wanted to talk about is sort of like where what I was doing um, or what I have been doing sort of outside of um, my nine to five daily work because I think that that's just as important um, and also um, it's where a lot of my my effort goes to um, in some of the activism that I am doing. So early in my career, uh, I had an essay published um, actually by um, the uh, AIA in Boston as part of this 20 on 20, 20 vision book. Um, it was a peer reviewed book. And um, that essay, I talked about the fact of being a black woman in architecture and not seeing people who look like me. Um, and I think the fact that I did that so early in my career sort of like allowed me to see the power of my writing, allowed me to see the power of my voice. And it led to me being an opportunity of me being a panel on an AIA Boston conference. And then for me, writing and presenting became an integral way for me to process uh, being part of a group that was underrepresented in the architecture industry. And it gave me a way to speak out and also support others professionally. Uh, I went on from that. And um, as Steve mentioned in my bio, I edited the Noma magazine for five years and have done a lot of publishing and writing because of that. And then uh, some of the other stuff I've done is um, thinking about the, the number of African-American architects and working with the Directory of African-American Architects to look at their data and also begin to sort of like track and actually show the trends of that data. The, the number has always been important to me because when I, when I started my licensure journey, I realized that African-American architects were such a small percentage of the industry and that I would encounter few in my daily professional spaces. Um, being at Howard, I was at a historically black college where I was surrounded by people who looked like me. Uh, but once I got out to the professional field, um, depending on you know where I lived and where I worked, that would not be the case. And so I tried to create uh, that support system that I had, not only growing up, but when I was in college. And that was the sort of the birthplace of the Black Women Architecture Network and the Black Women Architecture Brunch. So connecting with others gave me the idea to foster this network in architecture. And um, we've been doing this annual event. And in October, we held the seventh uh, Black Women in Architecture Brunch uh, with a hybrid and hybrid virtual plus is how we framed it um, because we had a virtual event that we encourage people to get together in small groups and do watch parties. So we had, um, I think about five or six groups that got together um, and sort of had watch parties while we did this event. Um, we had a presentation um, and then we had the groups that got together in person, um, you know, could get together after the presentation and sort of network and um, sort of foster that community. And the first event um, we had 40 women sort of excitedly uh, coming together in the DC area and um, it was the first time in about um, 
I think in about 15 years, because um, sort of after I'd done this event for a couple of years, I learned that in the 80s and 90s, some women had also um, held similar events. So we got together in a conference room that we borrowed from a local firm, and it was for a few hours on a weekend. And we realized that we needed that network um, to mentor each other, uh, to start to foster um, networks so that we could work with each other and to partner with each other um, and to build that community um, of support. And today my organizing has evolved to thinking about like who is, our, who is in our profession and how do we make sure that we as black women are at the table and succeeding. And this is especially needed as development occurs and is stressing predominantly black communities and also as we realize that we bring a different set of priorities and perspectives to projects. So out of the brunch, uh, we uh, realized that we could use that event um, as a fundraiser. And so we started um, gathering funds when we had that event from sponsorships, but also from um, like tickets. And we created a scholarship, a group of us uh, created a scholarship in honor of Desiree Cooper, who was an architect in the DC area who uh, tragically passed away in 2015. And that, that scholarship now supports those on licensure. And it uh, basically we um, do an application and people can apply for money to help pay for the licensure exam. Um, and we felt like this was one place where um, uh, people sort of get caught where um, sometimes firms pay for the exams and sometimes they don't, or sometimes people need additional funds to pay for study materials or courses. And so the service uh, that I and many others of uh, people who have partnered with me has indirectly helped support the activism to foster more Black architects entering and staying and succeeding in the profession. So following sort of on my uh, writing and publishing, um, knowing the importance of licensure, I created a website called arcstories.com. And this was something that I started when I was getting licensed. Um, a, a group of us were sort of on an email thread together. Um, we would email each other when we were taking our tests and just uh, as a way of supporting each other. And I realized that hearing from people who had already uh, gotten their exams done and were in through the process, um, having their stories would be a way to help inspire people and also just to help uh, know that, you know, they weren't the only ones on this journey. They weren't the only ones, in, in, you know, encountering obstacles um, that we all have as far as getting licensed. So uh, I started collecting those stories. And then a couple of years ago, I started publishing them on a website. And right now, I think there's about over 30 stories there from architects, um, all different um, ranges from, I have a few from like the 70s and 80s all the way through current days, uh, 2020s. Um, architects getting licensed, um, some who, you know, finished their exams all in one pass and never failed anything, and some who failed lots of exams. Um, but I think they all have a story and it's all unique. And it's important that we um, are able to share those stories and able to provide um, a way for people who are on the path to see that, you know, they are not the only ones. And um, there are lots of ways to get through that uh, that ordeal, I would say, of, of getting licensed. I also worked with uh, Arthur Mel Mitchell last year. Um, he wanted to publish a book uh, sort of talking about African-American architects and um, the firms that African-American architects own and how to increase the number of firms, but also increase uh, the work that comes to those firms. And the book also shares a uh, history of architecture firms, um, many from the DC area, um, but also a few nationwide sort of looking at their past and how they were able to succeed and sort of where they are today. Um, so that that was important, I think, as a document, as a documentation tool and as sort of as a historical record of some of those firms and, and also as a forward forward thinking way of like how how do we ensure that these firms succeed in the future. And then this past uh, fall, actually, um, uh, Architect Magazine did a issue on NOMA for the 50th anniversary and I wrote an article about HBCUs and how they benefit the profession, um, realizing that out of the 130, I think, architecture schools, only seven, uh, there are only seven HBCUs um, as far as the accredited architecture schools. So it's a small percentage, but they graduate almost 30% of the Black architects in the U.S. So 
um, it's vital that those programs uh, remain and are strengthened and um, supported. So that uh, article came out in the October issue of Architect Magazine. So I think uh, on my service part, you know, I'm still writing, I'm still publishing, uh, I'm still serving on uh, AIA committees and NOMA committees. Um, and as Steve mentioned, I have uh, a local nonprofit in Baltimore that is trying to do a uh, housing project um, to benefit community members here um, are some of the things that uh, my service, uh, my service time uh, is, is spent. Um, but a lot of those things, like I said, uh, delve over into the activism um, lane um, because of the, the initiatives and the causes that they um, are benefiting. Um, so I think next, um, I just wanted to put this in here because um, I know I don't look it, but uh, I've been in architecture now as a professional for 20 years. And I think uh, one of the things that I'm doing right now is trying to foster the next group of servant activist leaders, um, trying to help people who are coming up in the profession um, find their place um, and also figure out how they can succeed. And for me, I think um, as far as like diversity and black architects um, spe specifically, um, sort of encouraging diversity is not really my wheelhouse as far as like talking to firms and like saying this is something you should do. I focus more on um, supporting and uplifting uh, those, especially African-American women who are here um, in the profession and trying to get here and um, that's, that's sort of where my service and where my activism lies. Um, so that is my presentation. I'll open it up for questions. Uh, that's really awesome. So I'm trying to think of the best way to do this. So if you'd like to ask a question, Raise your hand, raise your e-hand, and uh, we will promote you to panelists where you can ask it. Um, you can also use the Q&A function to type yeah. questions in. <clears throat> well, okay. um, if everyone's, I see Erica has raised her hand, so hold on one second. Yeah, I'm going to promote her to panelists, and you can just ask your question. Um, all right, Erica, you can unmute and ask ask away. Hi, thanks so much for, for your talk, Catherine. I really enjoyed hearing about the incredible expansiveness of what you have going on in your career and from writing and, and practice uh it's it's a lot to it's a lot to take in um so thank you first of all for for sharing that and setting um such a high bar for <laughs> for the rest of um I, i'm thinking about um uh, identity in in space um and there you know been a lot of uh, a lot of reckoning um in in architecture over the last couple of years um with regards to our profession's uh responsibility to diversify um and appreciate what you said about you know you're not so you don't find that your niche is in recruiting right that's not your job but it's in support but um, uh, support for people who have already entered into the into the field and and but I'm, I'm thinking about could you could you speak a little bit more about why it's so important right we want to increase numbers of black architects black women architects in particular um but why it's important for black designers to be working on behalf of communities in, in seeing themselves in the work and seeing um, seeing Black designers coming to communities as professionals. And it's just going to like talk a little bit more about that. Mm -hmm. uh, sure. Uh, I mean, well, so first of all, I think um, I, I worked with a, with a co-author because um, 
basically since I've been getting licensed or since, sorry, since I got licensed when I was like first curious about the numbers and started looking at them, um, uh, I've been writing like an annual uh, article about where we are in the numbers. And so, you know, one of the things that we talk about is just parity, right? If, if African-Americans are 12% of the profession, but are sorry, 12% of the US population, but we're only 2% of the architecture um, as far as licensed professionals, um, then just the parity is just off, right? So that means that a lot of, a lot of people who need architects aren't gonna see a black architect if that's something that they're seeking out. Um, and I think that in, in certain communities that that perspective is needed, right? It's, it's very hard to go into a predominantly black community and um, feel like uh, as an architect that, um, you know, on their side, I think on the community side that they can relate to uh, someone else coming in. Um, not, that, not that someone could not at all, but I think, um, especially um, in in communities where they have been, um, there have been so many sort of like either studies or development plans or whatever like that. Like I worked in San Francisco, and I worked in a neighborhood that um, had had you know over probably like over thirty years, right since like the the seventies when um, urban redevelopment had started happening. Um, there had been so many like studies by universities or by architects and plans and da 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 da, and so a, a majority of that time, right? They were only seeing white architects or white planners come in and do those things, and it so it very much feels like this is other people imposing their views on a community. Um, not that not that a black architect wouldn't can't do that either, but it's it's a different level of engagement and a different level of um, sort of um, affiliation with the community if if a community feels like that they you you can speak their language you know that you know the experiences that they have gone through um, or similar experiences that they have gone through um, so I think that that's why it's important like you know I wouldn't go to Mexico and be like oh yeah let me bring my architecture down to Mexico and you know because like I'm not Mexican I don't know that community you know even you know like whatever um, we bring, we bring like all the experiences that we have. And so I think that that's why, that's why it's important. And even if it's a multi-diverse team, like having a diverse team versus having, you know, everyone who's an architect that graduated from Harvard, if they come into a community where nobody has that experience, um, it's a very different conversation than if you have people who have all kinds of experiences from all sorts of places and can bring that to the table. Thanks for expanding on that. I really appreciate your response. And we have some questions that are being sent through the chat. So this one from Ann Marshall. Thank you, Catherine. What significant barriers do you see to African-Americans entering the design field? And what can we do as a university to lessen these barriers? Um, there's a lot of barriers. Um, I think, uh, um, the group Equity by Design has done a really good job of like identifying points from like, you know, elementary all the way through the profession as far as like um, what they call pinch points um, for uh, creating points where people, you know, sort of leave the field, um, whether it's, you know, starting on the elementary middle school side and just like letting people know what an architect is and like what we do and, and how they can become one if that's something that they're interested in. Um, I think at the university side, um, you know, cost is always an issue. So um, how are we supporting people as far as cost of, of a degree in a program? Um, how are we, how are universities supporting people um, on the, I know licensure isn't really like the university um, sort of like task um, focus, um, but making sure that once uh, people graduate and they want to pursue that licensure path that they feel prepared to do that. Um, they feel prepared to be in a firm, right? So I think that's what um, universities can do is help help people get that uh, entry level into a firm, whether that's um, providing vehicles for internship, um, you know, at the third year level, um, whether it's career fairs or relationships with firms so that students can start developing those so that they can um, make that transition from school into the profession um, easier. So those are, those are just for that like university um, time period, I think, are two things. 
Thank um, you so oh, much. I, and I will say, sorry, I will say one more thing is um, uh, uh, just uh, also culture of the university. And I don't know, um, I don't know UMass very well. I know a couple people there. So, um, but just like culture, um, you know, we always talk about studio culture and how people are, are um, how people feel in studio culture, whether they feel like, you know, that their, their ideas are welcomed and valued um, versus if they aren't, um, you know, are, are schools teaching beyond sort of like the white hetero um, male uh, culture of architecture and actually exploring um, cultures beyond that, whether that's, you know, South America and Africa, Asia, as far as precedence um, in, in courses. Thank you so much. Um, we're gonna alternate between the people with their hands raised. So I'm gonna elevate Hannah two panelists and you can ask your question. She should be coming in. Yeah. Oh, did we lose her? Okay. So, um, <laughs> Hannah says that's by accident. So um, Rayman, a, a colleague here at, at UMass, I feel that often potentially talented and capable students get filtered out during K through 12. What has been your experience and have you seen, uh, and have you seen or find ways to reach younger people? Um, yeah, so I, um, when I, uh, I've done the uh, NOMA has a project pipeline uh, camp that they do um, chapters nationwide uh, do. Um, so I participated in that. I also participated in um, San Francisco. Um, San Francisco State has this program called Y Plan where they are, um, where they specifically work with students in schools um, K through 12 uh, around architecture and planning. And we were specifically working um, with a public housing site that was getting developed, redeveloped. So this was a elementary school that was next to that site. Um, so we actually, over several years, went in for like six weeks at a time every year um, and met with the students and talked to them about planning and architecture specifically around um, that public housing site. So it wasn't necessarily over architecture recruiting um, tool as far as um, them being architects. Um, but it also, it introduced them to architecture and to planning, um, but also gave them, even if they weren't going to be architects and planners, uh, an introduction to the field, an introduction to citizens being advocates for better architecture and better development in their communities. Um, so I think programs like that, where you're doing camps or um, other programs where you're introducing kids to uh, the profession is a good idea. Um, and then also, I think on the high school side is making sure that um, counselors and people who uh, guide students um, actually know what an architect does. And, um, you know, when a student says they want to be an architect, not to discourage them, but actually, um, you know, sort of have the information so that they can, um, they can uh, help students who want to, want to be architects because, um, you know, there's different degree types and um, different schools have uh, different uh, focuses as far as their education. And I think for a counselor um, who doesn't have that information or who, you know, has never met an architect or doesn't even know like all that, that one goes through to become one, um, it's very hard for them to have a student say they want to be an architect and, and have to tell them, be able to give them the right information. So that's another thing is like, um, you know, whether that's um, universities, you know, making sure that their local high schools um, have that information um, would be one way to, to do that. Um, I, you know, I, cause I have a, I have a, I know a couple people who are like second career architects because either they were interested and someone discouraged them from doing it, or they were interested and never figured out how to, how to get there until, you know, they had done one career and then went back to grad school and became architects. So um, I think that's, that's one way at the K-12 level. Thank you so much. So what I'm going to suggest now is that we, um, there are 50 people still in the audience. What I'm going to suggest is that Rob and I can elevate them all into this particular Zoom room, and then we can just simply have a conversation with and see everyone. So it's 
going to take us a minute or so to to do that. So um, if you wouldn't mind everyone just holding your questions and then we can all just chat live. So here we go. I believe you should be able to turn your camera on now if you want, once you're in the, in the panelist room. There's a lot of people named Sally Dillon. <laughs> Maybe that's because I uh, shared my link with people. I think that's right. It's like to tell the truth. <laughs> well, the real Sally Dillon, please stand up. <laughs> There's really only one of me. <laughs> can you hear me, Catherine? Yes, I can. Oh, I just wanted to thank you for sharing that story with us, your story of your architecture career that is very interesting and um, nice of you to share. And um, I, I think, you know, the, with the questions, it kind of looped back to that you're, you know, hearing about um, being an architect at a career fair and, you know, as a young person. And mm -hmm. I, I just think it's so important. Um, I don't know how that happens, but, people doing service and going into schools and letting people know that there is such a career to, to young children. Yep. It's really an important thing to do. And you're a good example. <laughs> Thanks for having me. My camera's broken, I'm sorry. <laughs> I can't, if I turn it on, you just see a black screen anyway. So, um, but I'm really, I'm curious, you talked about um, how that, kind of an early invitation to to write about your experience kind of inspired you to write more um and I you know we don't talk a lot about writing as a important component of of architecture and I'm like what is the connection for, like what is the connection for you what's the relationship between between practice and exploring ideas in uh through paragraphs and text hmm. um well as a, as a project manager, I actually write quite a lot. Um, so I think it's really important, right, to be able to express your ideas. Um, you know, drawing is one sense of that, um, but being able to also verbally, like, tell people what you're thinking and describe what you're thinking, I think is also important. Um, so, yeah, I think, uh, uh, you know, sort of, when I, when I started writing, when the first, I think, like, essay and, and those kind of things, it was, um, you know, it was something that I couldn't draw, right? Because it was, like, about, like, my career and how I felt as a professional in the career. It wasn't something that I necessarily, I guess, I guess maybe if I was a, a more, like, artistic, like, painter kind of person, like, maybe I could have gone that route. But um, for me, like, writing was a way for me to get my thoughts out and um, for me to express some of... Um, some of what I was seeing in the profession. You know, I think we always like default to, oh, make a diagram. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's interesting. And then you, you also share it, right? Like the networking seems to be a really important thread through every aspect of your work as well. Just not just keeping it to yourself, but getting it out in the world some way, allowing yeah. other people to enter in. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I think um, I, I think that I 
thrive off of, um, you know, sort of like the network and, and being able to talk to other people about what their experiences are, whether it's the same as mine or different than mine. Um, you know, the arc stories thing kind of like started as like a, a whim. Um, and even now, like when I write, when I ask people to write for that, um, you know, I'm like 30 stories in and I, you know, you think, oh yeah, it's going to be the same. But no, it's not. It's everyone is different, right? Everyone has gone through, even though we're, we're all gone through the experience of taking the exams and getting licensed, like it's all very different because people have different family experiences or where they lived or the firm or, that they're in or, you know, how they, how they decided, you know, even that they, like, licensure was really important to them and they wanted to get through this process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I need to check out that website. I'm really curious about it. Like in the, in the age of the tweet, you know, <laughs> long form writing is, it feels special, you know, yeah. taking yeah. the time not only to actually author it, but then to read it as well. Yeah. There, there. Most of them are, are self-authored. A couple of them uh, where people felt less comfortable. I interviewed them, um, and then wrote, and then uh, you know we sort of went back and forth. Where you know I interviewed them, wrote what I got from their interview, and then uh, let them read what I wrote and kind of edit back and forth about you know what they what they want, what thought was important, and um, how they wanted to how they wanted to the story to be told. We're having trouble moving the remaining 18 people into the room. And I don't know if Rob, have we reached an impasse here? Um, I think they've all been <clears throat> had a chance. So I'm not sure. I'll try it again. Yeah. So they have to do is, that. Just as you were talking about that, if there are any um, particular stories from the ARCH stories, project that stand out to you or that really, I don't know, change the way that you think about the, the profession or experience of getting lights in here? Um, so many. Um, well, the one that I published in October um, uh, was someone who uh, took, I think, almost 20 years to finish. Um, because she experienced the rolling clock, like not only once, but I think at least twice. Um, and so like reading her story was actually really frustrating for me uh, because she missed the rolling clock by like a week the first time. Um, and so like those kind of things are things that I think like spark the activism part because it's like, that shouldn't have been, that shouldn't have happened, right? It, it, like a week, time period of someone like taking their exam and like being able to finish the process versus like they lost all their passes and had to start the process all over again I think is a really sort of like harsh thing for our profession to say like oh sorry um so I haven't I haven't done anything with that yet but um that's one of the stories that uh really sort of is disheartening for me like I'm I'm really glad that she finished um, and that she got through it. And I think everybody in her community like really celebrated her. But I also feel like um, it's sort of a thing that we need to look at. The, when someone talked about barriers, we need to look at the barriers that are in the profession and like how we how we create those roadblocks to someone that really wants to be an architect, um, um, need, needlessly creating these roadblocks. Um, so that was one. Um, and then just talking about the, like when I was talking about the second career, um, the second career architects, like I know one of the stories was from a woman who um, was from a woman who uh, uh, sorry. Um, was from a woman who uh, wanted to be an architect in high school and her high school counselor basically told her like, oh, that's not a good profession. Like you'll never, you know, I think the thread was that she would never make any money being an architect, which, you know, yay or nay, we don't, we, you know, it depends on what you do. Um, and, uh, so she went into accounting and actually, um, did that for, I think like five or 10 years before she was like, yeah, I'm good at this. And because, you know, she was good at math. Um, and she was like, yeah, I'm good at this, but this isn't really what I want to do. And so she just tried a course, um, through, I think she actually went through the BAC and just tried a grad course and was like, you know, let me see if this thing that I always wanted to do was actually something that I would be good at and um, ended up going back to school um, 
going back to the grad school and um, she's a principal at a firm in DC now. So um, wow. yeah. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> Sounds like what we should all do is get go out to these high schools and uh, do a little yeah, <laughs> intervention with the advisors. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, definitely. I guess I've been doing a lot of uh, thinking. I'm, I'm teaching a course called the American Home History and Evolution, and sort of the the more I go with it, the you know the, the kind of profound impact of racism on almost every aspect of the built environment is just you know just keeps getting deeper and, and deeper <laughs> to me. And just wondering if, if, I don't know, is there, is, is there a way to kind of strengthen that dialogue in schools? And, and you know, a lot of it maybe has to do with doing more inter, interdisciplinary teaching so that we you know, look at how policies are formed or how you know, psychology works in these environments. But I don't know, what, what is your... Any thoughts on that or um yeah i mean definitely from uh, i mean i think steve and i were talking earlier about um uh, i'd moderated a session for the a housing and all uh community development knowledge community about um uh redlining and well sorry not redline well i did do one on redlining last year but i also did one recently on um desegregate uh connecticut um so just talking about um talking about those policies, right? Because I think um, if you don't go back and look at the history of the policies and look at the effects that they have had, um, you just assume like, oh, well, that person can't live here because, you know, oh, they don't make enough money or whatever like that. But actually seeing like, no, like people were, you know, intentionally excluded from not only neighborhoods, but from getting loans. Um, or even to get loans for their own neighborhoods, right? To improve housing and their, you know, improve their own house, like they, their neighborhood was shut out. So um, I think uh, it's, it's really important for students to know those things and to, um, to, to also recognize that we as architects um, on the architecture and design side, but also the policies that allow us to build where we build um, have, have deep roots and things that aren't always greatest as far as policy side. So I don't know if that answered your question, but yes. <laughs> yes, it should be taught. And you know, whether it's whether it's yeah, I mean I think I think interdisciplinary classes like with you know with your your policy school as well, you know, whether that's the the poli sci department or you know a planning department, um, I think that would be great uh, to sort of be able to cross um, cross pollinate some of that stuff. <laughs> I think, uh, thank you so much, Catherine. It was really, really uh, a terrific lecture. And uh, I really, I think we all enjoyed the, the conversation. So, and thank you so much to the, the Dillon family, the Dillon friends, and to all of you for supporting this annual lecture series and for coming tonight. So, so um, once again, <laughs> big round of applause for, for Catherine. Thank you. Thank you, Steve, for, uh, and you asked for inviting me. And yes, thank you to the Dillon family. I told Steve uh, when, when he sent me the invitation, I was like, well, let me go see who Dylan was. And, and you know, especially on the writing side, it was, it's really great to be able to follow someone who had a long history of um, writing about architecture and, um, and also teaching. So. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Take care. Thank you.